Welcome to Rock Club program, Bul Ahdan, a show with an accent for those without one. You know, racism and the history of African America has been a long history in this country. It went from Jim Crow now to Ferguson and police brutality. We have a very special guest here. She has really been active in talking. And, and Professor Nikima Levy Pounds is a professor of law, civil rights attorney, also teaches at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, of all places where one of the lawyers over there was the master of the torture notes. Welcome to Bil uh, uh, Mr. Lavi. Uh, very nice of you to come here. I know this is a Saturday and you have better things to do, but thank you for coming. And uh, tell me a little bit, uh, because I missed that event last night. It was the uh, opening of Selma? Yes. It tell was us a little bit opening. how did that go? It was incredible. Number one, uh, the movie Selma got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is extremely unusual, and it was phenomenal. I'm still in how, awe how by what I saw. Uh... Just well, one, the cinematography was great, but more importantly, getting a bird's eye view of what happened historically in this country during the Civil Rights Movement, seeing um, Dr. King be humanized on film was really powerful, and seeing the courage of those who stood alongside of him, braving police brutality, braving political repercussions to stand up for what they believed so in. So the film, let's say we saw a lot of that documentary, we see this horrible things, actually we saw it, the, the actual deal. Yes. How did the film dramatize that and uh, illuminate some of this uh, uh, issue that we've been living it for all these years? Well, there were times when you knew during the film that there was fear in terms of which approach to take in order to um, take a stand for justice. However, the characters really internalized that fear, um, but more importantly, they internalized the courage that was needed, and you could see that being displayed, especially during the scenes where they faced police brutality, especially during the scenes where people were actually murdered. It's, it's, it's amazing timing for this film. Yes. So when you see the images that happened in the 60s, even before that, and Martin Luther King March and all that, those images is, is, is almost similar to what's happened in Ferguson. Do, do you see any correlation? Absolutely. That's what kept running through my mind like a movie reel as I was watching the different scenes and seeing the police lined up um, with some of the gear on, ready to go after protesters and demonstrators. It reminded me of what happened at Mall of America here in Minnesota very recently, where instead of being welcomed um, during our nonviolent peaceful demonstration in December, we were greeted by police in riot gear, which was completely unnecessary. And, you know, 25 people were arrested. I see a number of parallels that are quite disturbing. You know, we are in the same building where the, that's a very same police. <laughs> so we have to be careful that they kick us out of the state. But uh, from the legal stand, uh, Mall of America is a private place. And I, I, for me, as a consumer, I go there uh, not once a year maybe. A shopping mall is a private, uh, even if it's owned by private, isn't it? You are inviting customer to come. Is there a legal basis for uh, this is a private I can Tell you not, can you tell people not to come if I'm shopping there? But how do you know you are a protester or a shopper? Right, and I think that day they didn't know because many of us were actually shoppers. Some had lunch there, some walked around um, and browsed different stores. So they, they didn't know who was who. And in fact, some of the folks who came there with the sole intention of shopping, I believe, joined in, in the protest. Well, was that a point? That was the point, to, to go where the people are. To go where the people are. Um, and some states actually see the mall as a town square, like Colorado, like yeah. California. Mm -hmm. um, and here in Minnesota, uh, that has been the crooks, crooks of the argument that people are making, saying this is private property. And we're pushing back against that to the extent that the mall has received over $400 million. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me, in, in tax subsidies, public subsidies. And it just seems um, unfair for the mall to try to have it both ways. Either you're going to be solely private, generate your own resources, or you're going to benefit off of the backs of the public. In um, return to open it up. Exactly. exactly. I don't have to, I'm not a consumer 100% of the time. Right. Sometimes 
I want to go there to think or right. not to shop. Exactly, exactly. Well, and we also saw a difference in terms of how other groups have been treated. So there's a Clouds Choir, uh, which is really popular. Um, they have appeared at the mall twice to sing in honor of victims of cancer, which I think is a very noble cause. Over 7,000 people, mostly white, if not all, um, and the mall essentially rolled out a welcome mat for them to come into the rotunda and sing. So how do they decide this is a, a public and this is a private? Exactly. That's the question that we're asking. Um, what type of processes does the, the mall actually go through in making those determinations? And how do we know that bias does not filter into those decisions? That's an interesting uh, point because you're not... You're not going there to protest against the mall. Right. You protest against a cause. It, yes. it just didn't happen to be the cancer or gay right. or, uh, you know, welcoming uh, Madonna or some right. consumer icon. Right. You're we going there, there for an even higher cause. Yes. Why we can't were there you? singing um, and raising our voices to say Black Lives Matter. And it was such a diverse group of people. That's a very disturbing uh, thing to say. In a shopping mall, black, black lives matter. Yeah, that's well. I guess the message that we receive from all of America is black lives matter if you're here shopping, because they tended to put profits over people, and that's really bothersome. That we can come there, shop all day long, engage in capitalism, but when we're coming there to talk about the value of human lives in this country and the fact that we're concerned about the ways in which vulnerable people are being treated under the law suddenly we're a threat to public safety. And we were met with a racialized response in terms of the mall making the assumption that there would be violence, that there would be rioting and things like that. They shut down stores, they trap people in um, various aspects of the mall and then arrested them because they couldn't leave. And so those types of tactics are quite disturbing. Isn't this the same problem that the police does when he see uh it's interesting because a police will see a, an actual black person that he is shopping in the 7 Eleven and buying candy or walking with whatever, and he thinks he has been a gun. Mm -hmm. Now you are going there, <laughs> it's a different law. I mean, he's rationalized. It's interesting. It's right. So, so what, what, what I'm saying, how did racism develop from Jim Crow to having the first black person, a black American president? Uh, how's it different than 60, 100, uh, you know, 150 years, 200 years ago? Well, I would say one thing that's different is the fact that many folks in the United States openly declare and really believe that we're living in a post-racial society. They say, well, if our society were, were racist, why would we have a black president? Yeah. Why would we have elected an African-American president? As though that solves all of the underlying systemic, deeply entrenched problems that have been going on for hundreds of years. Um, and the difference as well is that when we walk into a restaurant or, <clears throat> excuse me, a hotel, we don't see signs that say blacks only and whites only. Mm -hmm. However, some of the, um, the, looks. the hidden, the looks and just some of the hidden responses mm -hmm. are still prevalent. Some of the sins of the heart in terms of racism are still prevalent and pervasive, and it manifests itself in what uh, Dr. King talked about was the silence of the majority. We're still seeing the silence of the majority today, whether people in the general public, um, whether folks in their churches across the country who are afraid to touch the issue of race, and that allows the problems to continue to perpetuate from one generation to the next. We've also never rooted out um, institutionalized racism, systemic racism, and it still impacts all of our systems to this day. But because it's hidden, we disguise um, the outcomes by saying it's based on individual responsibility. It's based on um, Hor Horatio Alger and the myth of being able to pull oneself up by one's bootstrap. And we say that it's not based on race, it's based on individual determination. And my pushback to that is to say, we have to look at the systems, the policies, the fact that some people have received a head start generationally and others have suffered from one generation to the next. You accumulate wealth, somebody accumulate poverty. 
how can that be uh, talking about equality? But it's interesting how black and white looks at uh, the, the latest event in Ferguson and mm -hmm. and uh, New York and what have you, you know, uh, why do we say, like when you say, I can't breathe, yes. uh, they say, uh, obey the law, uh, don't right. resist. So they look, it, it, what, what I'm thinking in a black, per, a young black person raised in a black family, in a black community, how is race to deal with that? I mean, it seems to me a white uh, kids who are raised in, in a community to obey the, the law, to, mm -hmm. to, to go with the system because the system working for them. Right. How, how the black family raise their kids about how you deal with the system, with the mainstream culture? Well, one, I would say even in terms of white kids and white families, you still have crimes happening in some of those families. You still have drug use yeah. happening in some of those families, illicit drug use or prescription drug use. Um, you still have underage drinking. You have a lot of, of issues that happen in white families that are often hidden, glossed over, and sometimes when they interface with the system, they're treated differently. There are so many studies that bear out how differently whites and blacks are treated when they um, fall arrested. into the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, but for African Americans, I can speak, you know, as a parent, as a researcher, as a community advocate, that we do our best to try to protect our children, especially our sons, from what they're going to face in the real world. So when I walk into a store with my boys, one is 10 and one is 12, I tell them, you know, keep your hands in your pocket and stay close to me. So you consciously has to... You have to instruct them because... I don't want them facing the humiliation if they're just browsing, picking up things and looking at things on a shelf, security following them um, and making them feel like criminals. So I would rather warn them ahead of time to try to insulate them from that humiliation and degradation that comes with being racially profiled even as a little kid. And it pains me as a mother to have to instruct my sons on how to deal with racism, but if I don't do it, I know that there are so many harms that will flow um, from them not knowing how the game is played and, and how the rules are, are really set up um, in this society. It is not a level playing field. And that conversation would not take place with a white mother and a, and a kids. What kind of conversation would the, would the white mother have with their kids before they walk into Mall of America? Well, what I typically, I mean, I don't know, you know, uh, <laughs> what, never, what never white moms white? say no, <laughs> to their children, but I mean, I typically see people being a lot more carefree and not having to carry those they are burdens. They're fun. They run around, the whole thing. They right, do the they're same just thing. boisterous yeah, and this having is a good child. time. We don't have the luxury. So when I'm walking in the store, I remind my sons be on your best behavior, stay close to me because I don't want them wandering off, like I said, and facing hostility from securities, from store clerks. It actually having the first black person, black president, uh, Obama, help uh, the issue of racism and black, it seems like, uh, for, for my opinion, people were afraid to criticize him uh, on those issues because he's black. Afraid. I mean, when you look at some of the cartoons and caricatures of Obama eating watermelon, I mean, just discriminatory. This is from the right wing and, uh, and, and, and racist. I'm talking about the people who are anti-racism, the liberal, the left, mm -hmm. were also careful in criticizing, like talking like you openly about racism in this country. Right. They were a little bit giving them like a free hand or a pass. Well, I think part of it is a general discomfort in talking about race that exists amongst liberals, progressives, amongst conservatives. Part of the problem that we're facing here, just a, a general lack of comfort in having the conversation. It's a specific problem here in Minnesota where people are what we call Minnesota nice. They will smile but not really share they call the how they after. feel. Exactly. <laughs> um, and I believe that that hinders our progress when we're not able to speak openly about race. Um, and I think people are now coming more out of the woodworks in terms of how they really feel. Um, and we see from the polls how people feel behind closed doors when it comes to racial issues, when it comes to Ferguson, when it comes to Eric Garner, when it comes to how they view the law. And um, I think we need to find a way to move forward and heal and make sure that we are taking seriously what's happening to the most vulnerable within our society. I don't think we're there yet. <laughs>